Now, a look at the flu vaccine shortage and efforts to prevent future shortages. This House Government Reform Committee hearing is a little more than two hours. government reform will come to order. I want to welcome everybody to today's oversight hearing regarding this year's uh, U.S. influenza vaccine supply. This hearing will consider how public perceptions and needs will be managed and addressed for the remainder of this flu season and discuss what actions are being taken to begin planning for next year's flu season. As many of you know, this flu season has been an unusual and difficult one. As a result of last fall's vaccine shortage, millions of healthy people and thousands in the high-risk population were unable to get vaccinated in a timely manner. Phones at doctors' offices, clinics, and hospitals rang off the hook with questions of where to seek flu vaccine, and hundreds of clinics were either forced to turn away or cancel altogether. Public health authorities responded immediately, demonstrating coordination and cooperation between federal, state, and local public health officials and private providers. Officials scrambled to identify and prioritize groups for vaccination and redistribute vaccine to areas where none existed. They were also able to procure additional vaccine from foreign sources to help compensate for the loss of Chiron's vaccine. The two remaining Food and Drug Administration licensed flu vaccine manufacturers increased production capabilities to maximize the number of doses produced for the season. Recently, the nation's flu vaccine shortage turned into a surplus with approximately 4.4 million doses remaining to be administered. The current surplus has led to confusion among Americans, with immunization recommendations varying from state to state and uncertainties of where ample supplies of vaccine exist. As the peak of the flu season approaches, it appears demand for the flu vaccine has all but disappeared and the public has lost motivation to get vaccinated. Only a few months ago, our senior citizens were waiting for hours and long lines to get vaccinated, and now there are no lines at all. We can't afford for Americans to underestimate the seriousness of the flu or take the importance of vaccination against the flu lightly. As unconcerned public uh, will only provide to make future flu seasons more difficult. Vaccines are life-saving devices and administering them is an easy way to prevent contracting and spreading a disease. At previous committee hearings, we have discussed proposed solutions to fixing the supply side of the equation. We have considered whether new mechanisms and incentives are necessary to guarantee that an adequate number of safe and effective flu vaccines are produced and delivered annually. Today, we also need to consider the demand side of the equation. Without a steady demand from a public that is confident the flu vaccine will be available to them each year, precious vaccine will be thrown out at the end of each flu season. Questions continue to mount, and hopefully some will be answered. How do we go from a shortage of vaccine to a surplus in just a matter of months? What happened to demand for vaccine? Are new public awareness campaigns or programs needed to increase and stabilize demands for the flu vaccine? What are we doing now to minimize the amount of vaccines thrown away at the end of this flu season? As we approach next year's flu season, will the message on who should be vaccinated change again? We also need to consider if uh, new mechanisms and incentives are necessary to guarantee that an adequate number of safe and effective flu vaccines are produced and delivered annually. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony today and a constructive dialogue on this matter. I said this before and reiterate today, we all share the same goal at the end of the day, a public health system prepared to deal with the annual influenza season. Let's not let the efforts to respond to this season's flu shot shortage be in vain. Everyone should continue to seek immunization as it is not too late and the flu season has yet to peak. As you will hear our witnesses testify, there are still at least two more months of the flu season. As a result, I am pleased to announce that today in Rayburn 2247 from 1 to 3 p.m., the George Washington Medical F uh, Faculty Associates will be sponsoring a flu shot clinic. This clinic is open to anyone and the shot is free of charge. I would encourage those who chose to forego receiving the flu shot because of the shortage to take advantage of this important opportunity. The committee thanks the George Washington Medical F Faculty Associates for offering to sponsor the clinic and for its continuing motivation to protect the public by encouraging flu vaccinations. We have got an excellent uh, roster of witnesses today, and I want to thank all of them for appearing before the committee. I look forward to their testimony, and I would now like to yield to Mr. Waxman for an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Davis, for your continued interest in the flu vaccine and the need to assure a stable vaccine supply for the United States. Because of your leadership, our oversight on flu has been more sustained than that of any other committee of the Congress. When we held our last hearing in November, it was a time of crisis. There was not enough vaccine to protect the most vulnerable Americans. There were lines of panicked citizens in grocery stores and pharmacies, and local health officials did not have a clear understanding of who had vaccine in their communities. During that hearing, we heard from administration officials about emergency plans to cope with the shortage. The administration also expressed a commitment to taking steps to make sure our public health system is better prepared in the future. Today, we're meeting at a time when there is no crisis. While there is still not enough vaccine to immunize the entire high-risk population, there appears to be enough to meet demand. Furthermore, at least for the, for the moment, it seems that this flu season has not been particularly severe. This moment provides an important opportunity to make plans to avoid future shortages. The challenges are no secret. We're forced to rely on too few companies to produce vaccines, leaving us vulnerable to the kind of shortage we experienced this year with the flu vaccine. We have not been able to maintain adequate stockpiles of important pediatric vaccines. And finally, there are major gaps in immunization coverage because of inadequate federal support of state and local immunization efforts. It's a mystery what happened to this administration's resolve. Earlier this week, the President presented his fiscal year 2006 budget to Congress. This budget cuts the Center for Disease Control's budget by over $500 million and slashes funding for public health preparedness at the state and local level by almost $130 million. The budget eliminates the Preventive Services Block Grant, which has been used to support immunization activities. And while the budget provides for some increase in funding for state and local efforts on flu immunization, it provides no new funding for states that cannot now provide other life-saving pediatric vaccines. The budget also fails to propose any solution to the problem of maintaining, maintaining adequate stockpiles. This budget ensures for another year that there will be children who will go without access to critical vaccinations, such as a, a life-saving vaccine against the most common cause of childhood meningitis. In place of vital public health programs, the President wants to boost funding for so-called abstinence-only education programs by 40 percent. Many of these programs teach erroneous and false information to thousands of teenagers, including that tears and sweat can transmit HIV infection. These programs also teach gender stereotypes as scientific fact, for example, that boys need respect and value accomplishments, while girls need financial support and value relationships. Well, public health, health threats are frightening and real. We need to confront them with the best possible science and policy. We also cannot afford to have anything less than strong oversight and uh, strong oversight over vaccine manufacturing by the Food and Drug Administration. Today's USA Today contains a detailed analysis of what went wrong at the flu vaccine plant at the center of this year's shortage. Experts who review documents released publicly by this committee found a history of serious problems with the vaccine, including contamination, improper filtering, and potency failures. USA Today also reported that the facility had a history of failing to investigate its errors appropriately and then failing to tell FDA about the problems promptly. Yet despite this record and despite the fact that our country was depending on the facility for half of our flu vaccine, FDA's oversight lapsed. In June 2003, FDA rejected the initial recommendations of its own inspectors to pursue official enforcement action against the facility. USA Today quotes a former senior executive at GlaxoSmithKline 
as stating, quote, if you look at what's in FDA's own documents, it's stunning they didn't get a warning letter or something worse, end quote, after the 2003 inspection. Instead, the company received a letter stating FDA would not return to the plant for full inspection for two years. USA Today concluded that problems persisted from 2003 to this year when British regulators shut the facility and triggered the shortage. This year's flu vaccine shortage is not just a wake-up call for those of us concerned about vaccine supply. It is a wake-up call for an agency and for an administration that appears to give companies the benefit of the doubt at every turn. The next FDA commissioner must change this approach and empower expert and dedicated FDA scientists and inspectors to do their jobs well. I look forward to the hearing today. I plan to use the information presented at this hearing to design legislation to fix the gaps in our vaccine system before the next crisis hits. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, and our colleagues, uh, and hearings such as this serve such a valuable role. And I want to thank the, the witnesses for coming in. I look forward to their testimony. Thank you. Are there any other members wish to make up exams? Yes, uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, too, for holding this critically important hearing to discuss the current status of our nation's influenza vaccine supply. As we are all aware, in October of 2004, Chiron Corporation, one of the three flu vaccine manufacturers licensed by the Food and Drug Administration, announced that the company would be unable to supply the United States with the flu vaccine we anticipated for the 2004-2005 flu season. Chiron was expected to provide us with some 46 to 48 million doses of flu vaccine, representing approximately 50 percent of the nationwide supply. One facility's failure to meet product sterility standards in Liverpool, England, did a great deal to expose the fragility of our flu vaccine system. As one might expect, such a shortage in flu vaccines and the resulting long lines and lotteries that followed in some areas garnered much deserved attention. Inquiries into who knew what and when, <clears throat> what was done to prevent and mitigate the flu vaccine shortage, and who should be held accountable have been thoroughly debated within this very committee. In fact, I personally asked many of these questions myself. While we may continue to disagree about the answers to those central questions, we must agree to look forward in the best interest of the nation and achieve our ultimate objective of ensuring that the American people have ready access to a flu vaccine that is safe, affordable, and effective. To that end, Mr. Chairman, every year 36,000 people die and over 200,000 more are hospitalized from complications arising from the flu. So let us never forget the importance of getting it right this time around for the un in upcoming flu season. Looking forward, we, we need to ensure that we have a diversity of suppliers that can meet our flu vaccine needs so that we are not <clears throat> overly reliant on any one of them. We need to explore what the federal government can do to provide meaningful incentives to encourage and retain the production of flu vaccines. Some have suggested that tax credits and patent extensions for companies that manufacture vaccines, uh, and, and we should probably explore those options. In the upcoming flu season, we must also address any uncertainty that may exist in the public about the availability of flu vaccines and any confusion about who should be vaccinated. I was troubled to read in a recent survey conducted by the Harvard School of Public Health entitled Experiences with Obtaining Influenza Vaccination Among Persons in Priority Groups During a Vaccine Shortage that over 50 percent of high-risk adults believe that they would not successfully receive a flu vaccination and therefore never tried to get one. The fact that we are experiencing flu surplus today <clears throat> is, is not necessarily good news. We must ask how many vulnerable seniors and other high-risk individuals attempted to get vaccinated but were unable to do so due to demanding weights and distribution problems. We should also ask how many Americans are still not vac vaccinated that need to be. 
While I am somewhat pleased that uh, we can report a flu vaccine surplus today, it seems to, too bittersweet to celebrate in light of the fact that so many Americans needlessly suffered due to poor planning for the flu season. We must also be mindful that the federal government cannot assume today's vaccine surplus safeguards the nation uh, from another potentially devastating shortage. Our nation must be prepared to, to safeguard our citizens by providing them with either the proper treatment for, for disease or a means to prevent infection in the event of an outbreak. If the American people are, <clears throat> are to expect excellence of our public health preparedness, then we must provide the proper means by which this can be accomplished. With that said, I was troubled to see that the administration's budget for fiscal year 2006 proposes cuts in funding to the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention in the Health Resources and Services Administration for state and local public health preparedness. It should also be noted that while the budget would positively increase funding for pandemic influenza programs, it also proposes an overall cut of approximately 7 percent or $530 million to the CDC. Our citizens depend on us to ensure that adequate vaccines or other medicines are available to protect them. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and once more thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and I yield back to balance of my time. Uh, thank you very much. Any other members wish to, uh, Mr. Mica? Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, continuing uh, this series of uh, hearings that uh, we began uh, when there was a so-called uh, shortage and uh, now we're facing a, a surplus. I, I sometimes wonder what the public thinks uh, when they uh, hear all this. Uh, first, they're told uh, uh, not to get uh, vaccinations. First, they're told that uh, the supply is uh, limited uh, and uh, we have women, children, people at health risk, elderly who uh, don't know uh, which way to go. And now we're told there's a surplus. Uh, one of the great things about serving for a number of years in Congress is, <laughs> and I, I'm now up to 12 on this, uh, this committee and in my service, is that you uh, see things from the long-term perspective. And I remember, again, I repeat this, uh, when we held hearings on uh, the lack of childhood uh, vaccination, uh, immunization vaccines, uh, and uh, uh, we've heard the drug companies uh, bash then uh, that uh, the, drug, the problem was the drug companies and that they were charging too much. And then we um, heard the accusations against the insurers, well, the, certainly they're price gouging and uh, uh, making huge profits uh, uh, on uh, vaccination, vaccines, and um, uh, soon we had uh, no drug companies or almost no one in the United States producing uh, these vaccines and uh, soon we had no one insuring. Uh, and so our next round uh, when we found out there was an alleged shortage was to blame the bureaucrats, uh, blame the agencies because uh, certainly they should have anticipated all of this. And what we've done is, and it was interesting, over the weekend I attended a conference and heard the head of our, our uh, state and local uh, medical society. And uh, I heard their, their speeches and uh, their plea was uh, for physicians not to leave the state of Florida and uh, for physicians really not to even leave the profession. And I was thinking this is sort of a microcosm of what we're creating. Uh, uh, you know, for health care. Uh, we're forcing providers and people who produce things like vaccine uh, offshore or out of our states or jurisdictions. I, th I think you have to go back and look at the basic uh, things that, uh, that have uh, created this situation. Still tort medical malpractice, liability reform uh, for manufacturers, uh, whether it be vaccines or other uh, products. Uh, the regulation of the industry and some of the things that we've artificially Im imposed that uh, why would you manufacture if you can't uh, make uh, uh, a profit? Uh, I, I was pleased to hear uh, 
the previous uh, speaker, uh, who I respect, Mr. Cummings, uh, say maybe it's time to look at incentives and some other things. And that's certainly what we need to do. But we need to get to the core of the problem so that we're not flying uh, people to uh, Great Britain or to France or someplace else to see what the problem is, that we actually manufacture uh, and we have incentives to produce uh, vaccines to provide medical services uh, in this country. Uh, so uh, uh, I think we've, we've got to look at some solutions. We're going to hear from uh, the bureaucrats, and uh, God bless the CDC. I think they've done as good a job as they could. But uh, the way we're operating uh, is wrong. And the, the lack of, uh, again, reliance uh, on domestic production or domestic medical services or domestic uh, medical professionals, uh, having them here in the United States and that uh, available is the only uh, 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 long-term solution. So I'm anxious to hear from them. Um, and we do need to plan ahead. But we do need to look at the core of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members wish to make opening statements? Yeah, um, yes, gentlelady from the District of Columbia. Mr. Chairman, I want to I, I thank you and, and Ranking Member Waxman for early focusing in on this hearing. I, I think it is very important to do so because I think what we've had is a loss of confidence in the two agencies that have been responsible. Uh, and part of our job is to help restore confidence Across America, when, when up became down and down became up, people were asking what happened, and they expect us to find out what happened. The reason I want to know what happened is because if you don't know what happened, you don't know how to keep it from happening again. Um, I think that the, 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 the two agencies, FDA, has, is already undergoing uh, uh, great scrutiny and huge bipartisan uh, criticism, which may indeed be related or at least not unrelated to uh, the failure to act uh, when they could have acted uh, at, at the manufacturing level uh, overseas. It call, calls into question the competence of the agency, their diligence uh, in pursuing any hints of, of problems. Uh, then, of course, the public turned to the uh, CDC, uh, which showed it didn't have a clue about what to do, had no worst-case scenario, uh, and, were, and, and were, were no further along than members of Congress who asked them questions as they tried literally to cobble together a way to deal with a crisis that was absolutely predictable. Half your supply is overseas. Uh, guess what? Something could happen to it. What would you do? Very troublesome. In a real sense, uh, it was like the anthrax scare, except that who could have predicted that? But you would have thought that the anthrax scare would have helped us prepare for uh, this kind of emergency, which indeed was predictable. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am, I am concerned because of larger issues raised here and that, w that have been raised in the Homeland Security Committee. We don't do a lot on health systems, uh, but I don't see any evidence that we are uh, able to deal with uh, unanticipated health emergencies. This was a test case. We failed it. And for, for, for those of us who think, think it doesn't matter, uh, this, this, was a, uh, this is an um, epidemic. I don't know what the number of deaths are, but we do know the tens of thousands of people die every year from, from flu. So, so it was important. Um, the problems at the uh, plant in England are so deep, inspections still have to go on, and apparently we still don't know uh, whether uh, it will be able to produce. So I'm sure we must have a plan uh, as to what to do next year. Um, I want to embrace what my uh, colleagues have said about incentives. Nobody expects that the pharmaceutical 
uh, uh, industry is any different from any other industry. They go for the highly profitable drugs. We've known for a long time that there's little or no profit in flu. Why haven't we done something about it? It's our responsibility on this side of the podium, and it's the responsibility of the agencies and of the administration to push us to do something about it. If this crisis doesn't do that, I don't know uh, what will. Uh, I believe the most important thing you could, uh, the, the, the two witnesses uh, could tell us today would be what their worst case scenarios are uh, given a set of, of circumstances and whether they have taken themselves through worst case scenarios so that indeed they are prepared for whatever comes along. That's what the American people expect from their public health system. I appreciate that both of you have, have come and I particularly appreciate the chairman calling this early hearing. Um, thank you. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Chairman, uh, very briefly, I don't have a formal opening statement, but I just would like to <coughs> say this. Now that this uh, shortage has turned into a surplus, uh, you know, uh, we've certainly found out that uh, uh, the way to get uh, everybody to take their flu shots is to tell them that they uh, can't have one. Pe human nature always, uh, uh, people always want something they don't have or can't have, and uh, we certainly found that's true even in regard to flu shots. And I know the Knox County Health Department, my largest in my largest county, uh, gave out more than double their ordinary number of flu shots this year. And leading from that, we need to make sure in all of this that um, I know we're going to do everything possible to make sure there's no shortage next year. But I'm wondering if in doing that, when people think uh, there's no shortage, will the numbers drop off once again that get these flu shots? So I think that's something that we need to take into consideration when we're going through all this. Thank you. This is very important, and I appreciate very much that you're continuing to hold hearings on this. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We're going to move now to our first panel of witnesses. Dr. Julie uh, Gerberding, who's no stranger to this uh, committee, is director of the CDC, and Dr. Jesse Goodman, the director of the Center for uh, uh, biologics evaluation research at FDA will discuss efforts taken at the federal level to manage the flu vaccine situation this season with a focus on the most recent uh, strategies announced by CDC in January. They will also um, distribute, uh, describe their efforts to coordinate uh, uh, distribution recommendations with local and state authorities and what steps are being taken in preparation for next year's flu season. Additionally, Dr. Goodman will provide the committee with a status report regarding the implementation of Chiron's remediation plan and how FDA is working with both British health authorities and Chiron to ensure Chiron is capable um, to manufacture for next flu season. Uh, let me thank both of you for reacting to this uh, crisis. Uh, whatever uh, mistakes people think that could have gone on before, it certainly doesn't lie with the two of you. And uh, you've been most cooperative, and as we've taken a deficit into a surplus, uh, maybe we'll send you over to OMB next uh, at the administration. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I personally appreciate the, the efforts that you have made uh, uh, on this, and we look forward to uh, your testimony and answering uh, uh, some questions. But, but thank you both for, I think, taking something that uh, potentially could have been worse. I think we've been lucky so far with the Maya flu season, but turning this around and, and, and reacting, and we can have a little uh, talk about what happened and why, but most importantly, where we're going next year. Is, is it's our policy we swear you in first, so if you'd rise and raise your right hand. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you both uh, for being here. Uh, you know the rules. We try to keep you to your entire statement is in the record, um, and your questions will be based on the entire statement. If you take about five minutes, uh, you have the lights in front of you, orange after four minutes, red after five. I won't cut you off, but uh, we want to leave uh, time for questions in the next panel. And again, thanks for your efforts, and, and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gerberding, we'll start with you. Great. Thank you. Uh, we really do appreciate your continued interest in this issue. It's been a very challenging flu season for all of us and I think very frustrating for the people who have been unable to get vaccine. Um, I have a map here showing the current distribution of influenza in the United States. As you can see, there are many red states. Those are states that are now showing widespread flu activity. So this red states are not the good states in this state. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Waxman would agree with that, but I just want to get that on the record. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that. Um, the uh, activity Who has chose what's red and blue on this and what they <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. 
we really wanted to confuse the political process. Um, what, what we're seeing is that there is an increase in widespread flu activity across our nation week by week by week. Uh, this morning we checked and we know that there is widespread uh, flu activity in Virginia and we do not know yet whether the season has peaked. So there still is a need to immunize people against this infection. We've got three big challenges. One is that flu itself is unpredictable. We can't say at the beginning of the year what this map is going to look like or how fast flu is going to spread across the country. And on the next graphic, I also remind uh, people about the evolution of flu viruses. We don't know from year to year what virus will emerge. We don't know what strain will be causing the majority of disease. And of course, now we're also worried about the avian influenza in Asia. So we're dealing with a very unpredictable virus and one that remains a biological and sociological uh, challenge. We have a second big challenge, and that, of course, is the unpredictable nature of the vaccine supply itself. That is in part because we're still using antiquated manufacturing methods that impart enormous risks to the manufacturers. We also do not have a stable market, and historically we've had low prices for the vaccine and low rates of in, uh, reimbursement. Lastly, we have the challenge of the unpredictable demand for vaccine. And that's something, as you pointed out, the shortage certainly drives uh, demand. We saw last year that a severe flu season drove demand, at least uh, at the beginning of the season. But we also know that no matter where we are in flu season and how much we encourage immunization, it's very difficult to create demand late in the season. And that's what has created this national shortage of vaccine, but a local mismatch between supply and demand, and in some cases, excess vaccine beyond the demand of the population. So what can we do about that? Well, first, uh, we can't change the, vi the virology of the virus per se, but we can innovate. And there are a number of innovations that have occurred even in the last year that will help us get a better handle on flu. I'll just point out um, that the laboratory capability for flu detection has expanded dramatically throughout our public health system this year, our ability to detect H5 strains, the avian strain. But in addition, CDC is conducting enormous amounts of research related to characterization of the virus, conducting the reverse genetics to look for novel ways to create vaccine strains, doing studies to look for uh, drugs, and trying to understand why older people are more vulnerable and less uh, successfully in immunized against the flu. We have also um, initiated a system to track in real time the emergence of vaccine in cities using Biosense, which is an electronic surveillance system, including uh, data from the Department of Defense uh, medical facilities and the VA medical facilities. This year, for the first time, we were able to see flu emerge on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis uh, much earlier than we could through some of our traditional tracking mechanisms. We also, for the first time, got proprietary information from Aventus, now known as Sanofi Pasteur, uh, to tell us who was receiving the vaccine, where it was being utilized, and how we can do a better job of reapportioning and reallocating that vaccine to treat people's needs. So while we can't change the virus, we can improve our abilities to detect and respond to it. On the next graphic, I've illustrated the changes in funding for flu, and I know this doesn't show up well, but I think you can see that trends over time do show a steady and uh, dramatic increase culminating in the President's 06 budget with a request for $197 million for influenza. That is an unprecedented budget request, and it includes dollars to purchase vaccine. It includes purchases of drugs for the stockpile. It includes expansion of the Vaccine for Children program to include 5,500 immunization sites that aren't currently covered, and a number of other steps to support CDC and the NIH uh, research and science enterprises. So we are making investments to help stabilize the supply. We know that the manufacturers need a modern production facility capability, and we know the manufacturers need a market. Over the last decade, the recommendations about who should receive vaccine have steadily increased so that now we recommend vaccine to about 188 million Americans. This in itself incentivizes manufacturers. We've also raised the reimbursement rate for administration at CMS from less than $4 to more than $18, and we've increased the price we pay for vaccine uh, to more than $10 through our Medicare program. So some of these efforts underway will certainly help stabilize the market, and we think help incentivize. That with the advent of our capability to purchase 
uh, vaccine and guarantee part of the market at least is something that the manufacturers tell us is very important in their progress. The last challenge is the challenge of demand, and this has been very difficult. I've detailed our communication efforts in my written testimony, but we do still need to work very hard to reach out to all cultures and all people and explain the need for vaccine. Let me end with a picture of what our achievement has been this year. I think this is very important to notice that compared to last year, the vaccine coverage rates across the United States in some cases are better for high-risk groups. For example, we've immunized about 50 percent of children between the ages of 6 and 23 months of age compared to a very low immunization rate last year. Of course, in part is due be because we didn't recommend vaccine for this group last year. Also, compared to last year, we have improved the coverage of high-risk children and we have improved the coverage of health care workers for flu vaccine. We haven't quite achieved the same level of immunization of our population over 65, but we've come close. Uh, about 60% uh, of those individuals have received the vaccine. Importantly, our targeting worked in that uh, immunization of the non-risk people uh, was less than half that it was last year, and we thank those people who stepped aside. So despite having 50 percent of the doses we thought we needed to begin the year, we have achieved almost the uh, same coverage of high-risk groups this year as we did last year. This represents a public health success and is in large part due to our public health system, our clinicians, and the vaccine manufacturers. And, particularly the heroic people who stepped aside to let the high-risk people go first. So we thank all of those individuals, as well as the team at CDC and, and, and NIH and FDA for their efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Goodman, thanks for being with us. <clears throat> My pleasure. Um, there's, a there's a button there. Try it again. Thanks. I think it's on now. Well, you've got to talk into it. Um, close. That's good? better. Okay, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Dr. Jesse Goodman. I'm the director of the Center for Biologics and Evaluation at FDA. I'm also an infectious disease specialist, and I think we share many common goals here today. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here today with Dr. Gerbening and to update you on FDA's efforts to address influenza vaccine needs and what we're doing to prevent the kind of problems we've had this year from recurring. Uh, I do want to assure the American public also that the safety, effectiveness, and availability of vaccines are among FDA's it. highest priorities. Um, as we've emphasized in previous testimony, influenza vaccine manufacturing is complex and challenging, and the market is very fragile, in part because increasing demand has been coupled by a decline in the number of manufacturers. For the 2004 to 5 season, only three licensed manufacturers began production. As you know, on October 5th of 2004, the British Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency, MHRA, suspended Chiron's license without prior notice to FDA. Um, FDA also concluded that the safety of Chiron's vaccine uh, could not be assured. As soon as we learned Chiron's vaccine would not be available, we worked with great urgency and close cooperation with CDC and the private sector, and I want to emphasize this was really a public-private effort, to explore all viable options to get additional doses. With Sanofi, Pasteur, and Metamune, we got approximately 5 million additional doses of U.S. licensed vaccine, increasing the availability of supply to 61 million doses. And I think that helped us achieve uh, you know, come close to the kind of coverage results of previous years. Because there was a concern, though, you know, we were all very worried because this is still a lot less vaccine than we've had in previous years. And because of that concern, we sought additional vaccine licensed in other countries that, if needed, could be available under investigational new drug applications. Um, we immediately sent teams to facilities of potential sponsors in multiple countries to evaluate their manufacturing processes, and we reviewed a huge volume of manufacturing and clinical data, all within a few weeks. And these efforts resulted in FDA being able to approve INDs that permitted the potential use of 4 million doses from GlaxoSmithKline and 1 million doses from Berna Biotech if we needed them. These interactions and those with other influenza vaccine manufacturers who also were highly cooperative 
provided valuable information, and they've created and strengthened relationships that we think importantly will lead to successful U.S. licensure of new vaccines. I want to also say that is one of the constructive outcomes of the challenges we've faced, and that I'm extremely proud of all this hard work from over 50 FDA employees, as well as our colleagues at HHS and CDC, who work very collaboratively for long hours, often on weekends and during vacations, to help meet this challenge. We took this quite seriously because we share all your concerns. I wanted to mention that it's often overlooked, but pneumococcal pneumonia is one of the most important and common serious complications of influenza. And it, it, it's, it itself is preventable through use of an inexpensive, yet even more than flu vaccine, underutilized vaccine. And in cooperation with HHS, Merck tripled its production of its vaccine from six to more than 17 million doses. And the availability of that vaccine can help further protect Americans from that complication. Well, you want to know about what our plans are, what we're doing, what the plans are for 2005 and future years. First to say we're doing everything we can to improve supply for future years. We're doing this with a dual track strategy. Because Chiron is a major issue, our first track refers to trying to help Chiron be able to produce again. Uh, we're doing everything we can to facilitate that effort of its correcting its manufacturing problems. In a dramatic change from where we were in October, FDA and MHRA, the British regulatory agency, now have an agreement with Chiron that allows full information sharing. We've used that agreement to collaboratively review Chiron's remediation plans and activities, and we are providing continuing and extensive feedback to both Chiron and MHRA in all directions. We're working together and actively communicating in addition on inspection activities. Only after passing MHRA and FDA inspections will Chiron be able to provide vaccine to the U.S. market. In the spring, when critical stages of manufacturing are taking place, we plan a comprehensive inspection to verify whether Chiron has adequately addressed its problems. While much, while much work remains to be done, I am pleased to report that it appears that Chiron is making progress. Okay, while working with Chiron, it's important to emphasize that we're also working on a second track to facilitate overall greater capacity and diversification in the U.S. influenza vaccine supply, something several of the members identified as important in their remarks. It's important to recognize, and you've also remarked on this, but I want to emphasize it, that the demand for vaccine, the demand, and other economic issues are the primary factors that determine whether a manufacturer will seek and maintain a license in this country, the strength of our manufacturing infrastructure here, and the amount of vaccine that manufacturers will produce. One important and often overlooked strategy that CDC and us are in full agreement on is to encourage vaccination throughout the flu season including January and February. To increase the total doses available, manufacturers can produce vaccine over a longer time period, and that becomes available during these months. Because influenza cases usually continue well after November and December, when most people are seeking immunization, later vaccination is beneficial. We need to better communicate this important public health message, and the clinic that you've sponsored today uh, is a great way to do that. In addition, we've also been doing everything we can to stimulate foreign licensed manufacturers to provide or, where needed, develop the safety and effectiveness data to get U.S. licensure. We've actively engaged with several interested companies. Uh, we've informed manufacturers that we're willing to consider creative approaches to licensing, such as accelerated approval based on surrogate markers like the patient's immune response to the vaccine. Finally, while we're doing all we can to have licensed vaccines for next year's needs, the experience and relationships we've built this near year will help us if we again need to obtain additional vaccine under INDs. Okay, and then uh, I just want to conclude with a few remarks of, of something I think is very important, which is we've challenged ourselves to identify other lessons learned from this year's influenza season and how we can use this experience to prevent uh, similar events in the future. Um, it's not all under our control, 
but we are making significant changes in response to our sort of after action and continuing analysis. One is that we plan to conduct inspections of influenza vaccine manufacturers on an annual basis. Another is this need to share more information. We are completing or have completed agreements that allow information sharing with numerous foreign regulatory agencies. We've also initiated a vulnerability analysis of other licensed products that we regulate that are critical to public health to identify other areas where actions to support supply might be needed. And we've increased efforts at global regulatory collaboration on approvals and standards. The, I think it's very important, because I know you're interested in pandemic flu, to know that the insights gained from these experiences are critical in informing us on pandemic preparedness. This is something we all care a great deal about, given the eventual likelihood of pandemic and the outbreaks of avian flu Julie mentioned in um, Asia. It's very, very important to emphasize that more widespread vaccination during periods before pandemics has not only its direct health benefits, but it increases vaccine production capacity and it will help America and the global community better prepare for an influenza pandemic. As Julie mentioned, the administration is making the largest investment ever made by the federal government in these areas. I do want to mention a couple of specific things that were not in her testimony. In November 2004, HHS awarded a contract to Sanofi Pasteur to help ensure year-round availability of increased egg supply in case it's needed for the pandemic or for this kind of future vaccine shortage. Research supported by HHS through the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease will help us move from egg-based production technologies <coughs> to newer technologies. While much work remains, these newer technologies provide important alternatives that could potentially shorten the time needed to produce vaccines. We welcome the continued support of Congress for this work, and we view preparedness as a critical responsibility and an opportunity. I see this as a teachable moment. What have we learned? What do we need to do to prepare for the future? In conclusion, when an adequate vaccine supply supplemented by effective antiviral medicines is available, we can greatly decrease our vulnerability and provide protection against influenza. We recognize the need to work with multiple partners, including manufacturers, to increase supply and move toward more modern, dependable methods of production. All of the steps we've described will not only help address our current challenges, but help protect us from flu every year and prepare us for future seasons or the, in the event of a pandemic. So I do, and all of us, welcome the opportunity to work with Congress to accomplish these shared public health goals. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Goodman. Let me start with you. The USA Today had an article discussing how a couple of years ago uh, some batches of the flu vaccine might have lost their potency too soon. And I know that you can't talk about specifics because it's against the law for you to do that. Uh, but could you explain generally about potency and what it would mean to an individual who had received a shot that was less potent? Well, uh, in fact, I'd be happy to, you know, every year uh, we actually assist the manufacturers uh, by providing standards and reagents needed to assess potency. And that helps, the major thing there is it helps manufacture the vaccine. They have to decide how much of each component to mix into the vaccine. So we help get them to the appropriate amount. But then in addition, they are required to perform st testing on the vaccine to show how its stability is maintained over time, that it doesn't lose uh, large amounts of that potency. So then a person might not have the protective response you would want them to have. Okay, and we require them to monitor that and report those events to us. Uh, we also do a lot, require other testing. For instance, we test every uh, new large lot, the monovalent lots, ourselves for potency. Uh, but the stability testing is then what happens thereafter. Uh, in this case, uh, there was a problem. Uh, the company noted diminishments in uh, st excursions from the specified uh, stability uh, limits. Um, this is information that our inspectors uh, found during that inspection. They performed a complete analysis of, and they determined that this is a concern, particularly that they were not reported to us, but that 
given the way this vaccine is rapidly utilized and the nature of the excursions and all the other information available to them, they did determine that they did not believe this was, at that time, a threat to the effectiveness of the vaccine. But, you know, that's still saying we were concerned and told them uh, to correct that. Um, should there have been a, a recall of those flu shots with less food? Um, that possibility was certainly examined, but again, because it was believed that these uh, changes, while of concern and outside of their specifications, I want to emphasize we were not happy with these, but the analysis was that these would not affect the efficacy of the vaccine at that point in such a way as to make a recall needed. I should also point out that would not affect safety of the vaccine. What does FDA do to ensure a manufacturer properly tests and reports its findings to well, FDA? Well, uh, you know, we things that we think are critical are specified, you know, in the license itself of the manufacturer. Now, see if your microphone's still on. Can you talk right into it? Hit it right here. I think I have to swallow it. It's, it's, it's a, okay. It, right, it's yes. a weak microphone. Okay. It's, it's, it's lost its potency. So. It's our <coughs> Yeah, this one is great. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I'm really suspicious. CDC so got this great microphone, and I got this. Okay. So, That's all right. You can mumble okay. if the tough question. I didn't really want anybody to listen to me, anyhow. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'll use this one for the hard questions. Uh, okay. I, well, I kept wondering because I talk loud and it right. wasn't working. Um, Yes, so your question was, what do we do to assure the tests are done? And what I was saying is that, uh, you know, in fact, uh, there are a broad number of tests that manufacturers are required to do as part of their license and as part of the quality assurance. And these occur at multiple, multiple steps during manufacturing and then also with the final product. We expect them to, if problems develop, they have certain procedures. For example, for certain procedures, they have to reject that vaccine for the U.S. market. Uh, if certain kinds of test results are obtained. For others, they are supposed to notify us within a certain amount of time or perform an analysis of those results and decide whether in their judgment the vaccine is acceptable. Uh, so all those are things are required. In addition, we do uh, testing, as I mentioned, on the bulk lots and at other parts uh, and final vaccine and other parts of the process as we deem uh, needed. Um, in this case, the manufacturer did not report these excursions in stability uh, to us in a timely manner as required, and they were cited for that. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And, and Dr. Gerberding, CDC has been telling the public uh, that it isn't too late to get vaccinated as the flu season can last through April. If we are stuck with a surplus every year, why doesn't the CDC consider extending the flu shot campaign? Uh, through at least February or March to avoid throwing away vaccine. Uh, would this help or does it just vary with the flu season? And one other question, how many deaths have we had this year due to flu in the U.S.? Is anybody telling? Um, the, the truth is we are working very hard to try to continue to encourage vaccine. Uh, one of the things we have done is make the emergency supply of CDC's vaccine uh, on loan to the manufacturer available to clinicians and if they don't use it, they can get a rebate as an effort to get them to reach out and get the vaccine, especially for these high risk people. Um, so we every year um, put out information and communications around late season vaccine, but it is human nature apparently not to be interested in that immunization uh, despite um, what we think is a pretty gold standard campaign. We have got to work on that. We have got to do the formative research to find out why and uh, change our communication strategy accordingly. And we need to also work with clinicians in the public health system to make this uh, a visible priority. In terms of the number of deaths overall from flu, it is too early for us to have that accurate information. Influenza per se is not a reportable disease. We do know that there have been at least four pediatric deaths from influenza this year, which is less than we saw last year, but still uh, unnecessary and, and tragic. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Waxman, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I get into the topic for today, I just want to tell Dr. Gerberding uh, my appreciation for the work the CDC did in coming to terms with the, uh, the, uh, the obesity issue and uh, reviewing the matter internally, convening uh, further discussions, uh, making uh, pledges to uh, 
changes or similar problems wouldn't occur in the future. I, I just want to commend you for the work your agency did. I am in very to grateful that. to hear that, and I'll take that um, back to Atlanta as well. Thank you. Thank you. I want to ask you uh, about immunization funding because we have seen an increase of $1.5 billion over the last decade, largely due to the congressionally mandated vaccine, Vaccines for Children program. But there is another immunization program. It's called the 317 mm -hmm. program. This is run by the states. And the states are supposed to make up for those who don't qualify for the vaccine, uh, Vaccines for Children program to make sure they're eligible for vaccines, as well as some adults. I'm, I, I think this is an important program, and I, I'm sure you, you share that concern as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Um, a number of states are telling us that they can't ensure that all kids get the vaccines they need. And we're going to hear today from the Health Commissioner of Virginia, who has testified uh, a number of times to this committee that his state cannot provide the life-saving Prevnar vaccine. Is, is it true that by expanding the 317 program, we could ensure that all children in the U.S. get all their shots? It is very difficult to do that on the basis of 317. And what is proposed but not yet approved is that we expand the eligibility for the VFC so that we could immunize these underinsured kids in facilities that are run by state and local uh, health uh, delivery mm -hmm. uh, programs. Right now, those kids have to go uh, outside of the system and they can't afford to pay for the vaccine, so they essentially don't get it. So the proposal is that we add to the VFC eligibility to achieve this kind of coverage. If that proposal doesn't pass or isn't approved, then we would certainly need to rely on 317 to continue that effort. Yeah. Well, I guess my concern is I think we're not funding adequately the 317 program, and that will provide a gap where some people who could be covered by it are going to fall through it. I just hope we can find more funding for that effort. Thank you. And, and before I, I go to uh, Dr. Goodman, there's another very peculiar issue that you're dealing with with the, with the uh, stockpiling of childhood vaccines. There's some SEC issue that's preventing some of the companies. This may be too esoteric an issue, but I just, I just hope that this issue is being approached with some urgency because it looks like uh, the money that was allocated uh, for the stockpile is not going to be used because the companies are not going to be able to do this because the SEC is not asking, not allowing them. I guess the only point I'd make there is we've got to do something to straighten this out. It seems absurd to let it go on and start making assumptions that we're never going to get that stockpile for those vaccines, which will assure that we'll have the supply for yeah, it. Thank you. That, that's a revenue res recognition issue, and it's, it's complicated. We've got to figure a way through that, and I know the companies are eager to do that, too. Well, thank thank you. you. Dr. Goodman, I, I, I have been critical of the FDA at, at, at our last hearing. Uh, at, this certainly came out, and I think the USA Today article also was pretty damning of the FDA's inaction in light of the, of the FDA's own inspectors coming back. And, in 2003 and saying they were, they, they were learning about problems at that Chiron facility uh, and uh, recommended that some action, enforcement action, be taken. Um, just to review the facts, the plant had a terrible record of compliance with FDA regulations, even a history of failing to report problems to the agency, and this potency issue is one of the problems they evidently failed to report to the agency. The plant was making uh, half of our flu vaccine supply. And in June 2003, the inspectors found serious problems again and recommended enforcement action, yet FDA decided not to conduct a full inspection for another two years. And we learned at the last hearing, FDA refused even a request to meet with the company to provide guidance on how to improve. And then, uh, and then eventually the, thing, the plant was shut down by the, the British. I, I review this because I think we need to learn mm -hmm. from yeah. this, and I appreciated your testimony that the FDA is taking that uh, constructive approach. I think there's a silver lining. If FDA is able to increase its enforcement and if the agency can empower its inspectors and scientists, then FDA can prevent situations like this one from developing in the first place. But it's going to take a commitment from FDA leaders like you and whoever the new commissioner will be. And I want to underscore that point. Uh, I, I, do you, you don't disagree with me, do you? No, I'm, I, you know, I don't think, unless you have specific questions, it would be that constructive for me to go over the old ground. You know, um, and I know Dr. Crawford answered your 
questions about that before, but I, I will just reiterate, um, you know, we are, and I can speak for him and myself, uh, you know, totally committed to doing everything we can to get high quality manufacturing and also, you know, to get the appropriate kind of uh, inspectional enforcement activities. I'm working closely with uh, John Taylor, the head of Office of Regulatory Affairs. You know, we've considered this issue very carefully of whether the annual inspections I talked about, which is a, a, a real change, uh, may be helpful. Uh, I, we think if it may be, given the dwindling number of manufacturers and how vulnerable this all is, that even if it just may be and we can approach it in a very preventive manner, uh, it's a good thing to do. Uh, Let me just say, uh, I, I appreciate that yeah. approach and I think it's constructive and I think that certainly there are good intentions on everybody's mm -hmm. part, but I was very disappointed in Dr. Crawford's testimony. I don't think he took responsibility for FDA's uh, pretty much hands-off approach, just trusting the company yeah. and not going out there to yeah. the British plant itself. But uh, I don't think we have time to go over all the, the, the past record. It may not be all that helpful. I just do want to register my concern. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. Um, I d you know, one comment I would make without, you know, wanting to re-engage the whole thing is that, you know, in 2003, when the sp inspectors went in there, they did find significant issues and concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, a number of the ones that were of most concern uh, were from 2001 and 2, and when they were in there on the ground, a number of those problems had been corrected. There, the initial recommendation of the inspectors, uh, you know, was as you discussed, but the normal FDA, they did follow the normal FDA process. They came back, discussed those internally, looked at the company's response, looked at the company's record, uh, met with the scientists uh, in the center and the scientific, additional scientific specialists, and, and they did make that decision. But rejected the recommendation of the inspectors yeah. to do more. Well, I, you know, again, I would just characterize it as actually the inspectors themselves. This is my understanding, because I have asked about that. You know, I, I, I think it's a, a legitimate question. Um, and everybody looked at all the data, and my understanding is they unanimously agreed, including the inspectors, uh, that there were a number of important observations, but this wasn't a situation where they had a safety concern at that time or, and I think it is important to say, and I've heard this from the people who were on the ground, that the situation that we found in 04 going in there was different by order of magnitude and from an, a, a situation where you would, with an extensive inspection such as in 03, you would find significant observations. You would want to make improvements in quality. Um, we would expect those changes. But in 04, uh, it, it's a qu very quantitatively qualitative. Goodman, the my, basic systems weren't working. My time is up. I just want yeah. to make one sentence here. From 1999 to 2001, FDA sent 36 warning letters to biologic manufacturers for manufacturing violations. From 2002 through 2004, FDA has sent six. This is a decline of over 80 percent. I, I think we need to do more, not less, and we ran, that's why I believe we ran into the problem we did. You may disagree with me, but that's okay. my view. Well, I appreciate Thank your you. input. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gutnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I'll, I'll ask a question the Chairman wanted to ask and uh, didn't get a chance. First, uh, will the CDC follow the lead of some of the states and drop the remaining restrictions on who should or can be vaccinated? <clears throat> uh, the decisions about um, the high priority groups are made in collaboration with the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and though we see coverage rates that are close to what we normally perceive, we still have millions of very high risk people who haven't been vaccinated. So from a national perspective, we have been consistent from day one. The highest priority still has to be our seniors and the people who are at very high risk from death or, or, or severe complications. But at a local level where some providers have it and others don't, it's the local health officer or the state health officer who has to make the decision in their jurisdiction what is the most common sense way to make the best use of the vaccine. We don't want to waste it. Right. And so we're really encouraging them to use what they have if they need it. If they can't get the high risk people, then give it to whoever wants it. So that, that was kind of a no. Uh, 
if I can, it was a good answer, but I, I think the answer is no, you, you're not going to follow the lead of the states. Then secondly, doesn't that create confusion among the public about who should be vaccinated and who shouldn't? The, the dilemma no. is that there are areas where there still is a vaccine shortage. We've surveyed all the states and there are specific jurisdictions where they need vaccine and they can't get it. So for us to say it's wide open for whoever wants it nationally really creates an additional burden on those places that are still desperately seeking vaccine. So we've tried to equalize that by moving vaccine from one state to another or one jurisdiction to another, but it's not feasible to do that with the kind of precision that would allow us to give a single uh, recommendation for the nation. So our dilemma is how do we uh, support making sensible use of the vaccine uh, and still protect those areas that have shortages and are even still talking about using the investigational vaccine if they can't get what they need through the manufacturer. So we still have a shortage and that I think is something that I know the committee is talking about a surplus and there are areas where we have excess vaccine, but fundamentally we don't have enough. Just for my own benefit, when you move vaccine around or when it was shipped here from Germany, how did they ship it? Uh, when we move it from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, it's generally either Federal expressed or, or moved through some kind of a courier that meets the FDA's requirements for a chain of, uh, chain of custody, if you will. Uh, and likewise, when we move it from the international sources to the United States, it goes through a similar process to assure that the cold temperature is maintained and that we document the appropriate uh, transport and storage procedures. So importing uh, these vaccines from Germany caused no concern for health? Well, the FDA, I'll let Jesse answer that question because it's really an FDA uh, requirement. Now, actually, I, you don't have to answer that. I, think that, that I don't know where the facetious question. No, well, I, I think I should answer because it is a good question too. I, I think um, uh, it, 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 vaccines are, and, and some of the other biologics are particularly uh, sensitive, you know, for example, to cold, other storage conditions, handling. Um, so what we want to do, and this is true with licensed vaccine or the unlicensed vaccine under the IND, because of course Chiron's vaccine would have been imported into the United States because it was being finished in, in England. So what we do is we, we have very detailed, the manufacturer actually has to submit to us detailed protocols that they have validated that show that the temperature is maintained, that the storage conditions are suitable, for example, for shock, that the temperature is monitored. And just like the stability testing that Congressman Waxman asked me about, if there are significant deviations, they need to report those. And in certain cases, they cannot use that vaccine. I, I just wanted to get on the record that it is possible to move drugs and or vaccines across state and national borders safely as long as you follow the right protocols. And it's well controlled. And you can do it with FedEx. Okay, that's, that's on another subject for another day, which uh, we will pursue perhaps in this committee and others. The other issue I want to get to, and I'm sorry, my time's almost exhausted here, but I am very concerned about uh, viruses that are uh, migrating from one species, particularly from poultry to, uh, to uh, pigs, for example, and then to human beings. And I want to know how much research you're doing, because, and, there, and I have a very parochial interest in this. There's a small lab in my district that is doing some amazing things on vaccines for pigs. Literally, you can send them a sample overnight, FedEx, and the next morning they will analyze what particular virus that is, and they will send the next day out the right vaccine for that for your herd of, of animals. Uh, and and in, in many respects, they have technology at this little lab that is all world. And uh, my interest in this is trying to bring some other researchers in, because I am concerned about the I mean, I don't like to use the term pandemic, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I don't play one here in the Congress, but I am concerned that we're not doing enough in the event that there were some new strain of virus that did begin to jump from animals to human beings. And I, I'm, I'm curious in terms of what the, the CDC is doing on that and what we can do to advance that particular kind of research. Um, thank you for your question. I would actually look forward to learning more about the facility in your district and so we can follow up with you on that. But the problem you're describing is one that we refer to as zoonotic infections. And actually 12 out of the last 13 new infections in people have arisen from animals. So it's an extremely high priority for CDC. And in fact, we just recruited the dean of the School of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Michigan to CDC to help us in part with our strategies and our innovations in this area. 
carry because we think it's so important. Love to have you come out and visit these guys because it, it was one of the most amazing things that I've seen. And, and as I say, the, the, the research stuff, the, the equipment that they have is amazing and that they can do this that quickly. And I yield back the balance of whatever time I might have. Thank left. you. Thank you, Mr. Goodnick. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I just want to follow up on um, something that uh, Mr. Goodnick uh, was uh, talking about. And as he was asking, as he was, as you all were answering his questions, particularly you, Dr. Goodman, uh, about the transfer of uh, medication drugs uh, from one country to another, I, I want to make sure I heard you correctly because it seems like there are different things coming out of the FDA. You said that could be done safely? Uh, <clears throat> the, the question that I was answering, you know, no, was. Well, then answer my question. Yeah, I will. Okay. Your question is can. In this case, all drugs, or is your question about vac influenza Let's vaccine? Let's just deal with vaccines right yeah. now. Yeah, okay. Because influenza they seem to be very sensitive. Yeah, no, I understand. They have shelf life, they have all kinds of issues. Yeah, okay, so with all that in mind, with extremely careful controls over transportation uh, conditions, you know, mo including monitoring, et cetera, uh, and in this case, there had to be extensive FDA and company involvement. In other words, this is normal, normal procedures for these companies and, you know, all the resources that would be involved in that. Two critically important things could be uh, dealt with and protected. Those are, is that the product you think it is and has it been under total custody and control? Almost like criminal evidence. You don't want the consumers, you know, the, the people in the district or Maryland to get a vaccine and have that not be flu vaccine. And then, is that vaccine still going to be safe and effective because of how it was handled, et cetera? If it's properly made and then with exquisite, uh, appropriate, monitored uh, controls, and then FDA oversight of that and all the resources that are entailed in that, I think that that, transport, that particular transportation issue can be met. I want to mention one thing here. Well, let me just let me yeah. just show you why I asked the question. I've got seniors who are sitting there right now yeah. looking at C-SPAN. Right. And they are hearing all this. And yeah. I've got to go back to my district and tell them that to explain this, that they yeah. can't get yeah. their prescription drugs because FDA says they can't be done yeah. safely. But let me, let me move on because I only have a minute. Okay. Um, I, too, was disappointed with Dr. Crawford's testimony, extremely disappointed. Uh, and I want to, I just want to know, when we, let's say we go through all the things we're supposed to go through and making sure Chiron is doing what it's supposed to do, and let's say we find out that we do have a major problem, what exactly are our contingency plans? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Thank you. We are working you know, with CDC and HHS, and I do want to mention that that coordinating and planning function you know, is in the Secretary's office at HHS. But let me tell you what we are doing in answer to that. You are absolutely right. While we are doing all we can to get Chiron on board to produce, and if they do, and they do it in a timely manner, you know, that would be a good situation, and it might be able to restore supply to a reasonable level. We have to, there's a lot of uncertainty in there, okay? Ultimately, it's up to Chiron to succeed, and it's a really complex, demanding process. They are making huge changes. Also, our British counterparts have to do their job and decide that it's okay too, and then we do. So there's a lot of unpredictability, so we need to do what we can to prepare. Okay, some of the things we're doing that are, I mentioned, we are extensively interacting with several foreign manufacturers who have been working with us and who have indicated their interest in seeking U.S. licensure. Um, we are hopeful that, at least in one case, that may be possible uh, in time for the coming year. Not guaranteed because, again, it has to meet the standards of safety and effectiveness that your constituents and me as a physician would expect. The other thing, as I mentioned, I think is valuable. We did go out and get additional vaccine and, you know, under all these controls and, you know, I would say spent thousands of hours reviewing the manufacturing, the clinical records, the adverse event records, 
in these facilities of vaccines licensed by what we would consider competent regulatory authorities in other countries. And we did decide, uh, as, as you know, that in at least two cases uh, of sponsors who were interested in providing vaccine in an emergency, that it could meet standards to be used under what we call an IND, where people would know they're not getting licensed vaccine. They would have to consent, but it could be available and we believe it would be safe. So we have that system in place now, and if we have signals that Chiron or the other manufacturers we're hoping to get on board, that that isn't working out, we would plan to engage that. And finally, I have to say that both the other licensed manufacturers, uh, Sanofi, now it was Aventus Pasteur, now Sanofi uh, Pasteur, and Metamune have been incredibly cooperative and have indicated their willingness, if needed, to do what they can to increase production. There is still uncertainty. I am very concerned about the risk. There are bad scenarios like those that played out this year, but what I am here to say is we are all doing everything we can to be prepared and in the long term to diversify this vaccine supply, strengthen it, and prevent those problems. Thank you. Um, Mr. Shays. Thank you. I have uh, three organizations that are on the top of my list of groups that I admire. One is the World Health Organization, the other is the FDA, and the other is the CDC. Um, I think you have extraordinarily difficult jobs, and I think you do it quite well. Having said that, uh, and I also believe we're never going to get supply and demand to equal. Uh, you know, we're not a communist society. We can't make people do things that they don't want to do. Uh, and so, in the realm of things, I would rather have surplus rather than, than, uh, way, uh, rather than a shortage. But I don't want the surplus to be created because we encourage people not to take a vaccine they should take. The first question I just want to ask you is the avian flu. When I was at the World Health Organization uh, this past month, uh, they talked about uh, this flu basically being in 20 countries. Um, and, and I want to know uh, what uh, kind of representation, and, and they said it, it could be go from, uh, a, it could become a pandemic if we're not careful. Um, I just want to know the views of each that each of you have. Um, we're very concerned about the avian virus in West Asia right now. Uh, we know at this moment it's present in at least nine countries, and there is a new cluster of transmission from chickens to people, although we still have not seen efficient transmission from one person to another. Uh, the virus uh, has uh, not evolved significantly over the past year, but it could do that at any time. And when that happens, there is an increasing probability that it could adapt and become something capable of causing a pandemic. Well, they, yeah, they basically said it was more likely than less likely to happen, that, that the, the trend lines are in the wrong direction. Uh, the, the situation there is you have an amazing juxtaposition of pigs, people, and poultry. And those are the three ingredients for creating new strains of flu virus that can be very effectively transmitted. And, and so we've got so much virus there in this incubator of uh, new strains that there is a very strong statistical probability that we will see emergence. We can't say for sure, but we're certainly doing everything we can to be on top of it. In Thailand, I'm told there is one farm that has five million chickens. And I'm told that at a country like Ireland no longer produces chickens because it's just so cheap to get it from a place like Thailand. So uh, it, it is, it is uh, something I just want to register my concern to both of you. Um, Mr. Goodman, did you want to, Dr. Goodman, did you want to comment on that? Well, <clears throat> I did. And when the pandemic subject came up before, I wanted to mention one thing that I think we're all involved in doing that's very positive. I mean, first of all, this is a, a absolutely huge threat and we are taking it very seriously. And CDC and us and our colleagues at NIH I have frequent uh, communication, including with WHO, et cetera. So we're tracking this, but we're also trying to say, you know, what more can we do to be better prepared? I mentioned more vaccine production capacity. I also wanted to mention one th accomplishment of HHS that I truly think is a bellwether and remarkable, and that is that we have begun production of vaccines and testing of vaccines that may never be used. The HHS led contracts to two different companies to produce pilot lots of vaccine that might be able to help protect against that 
avian flu were it to become pandemic I'm, One flu. thing I'm not clear, just a quick answer on this. Is the flu shot that people take here, would that protect them against the No. Air? No. No. That's the whole problem is that okay. this is a new, new coat on the outside of the virus that our generation of people have never been exposed to. So when you're exposed, you don't have existing antibody, and nor is it in our current vaccines. Let me quickly uh, get an answer to this. How far behind are we in planning for the next flu season? I have, I have been made aware that you know, major vaccine distributors have refrained from taking pre-orders because they are unable to calculate next season's market. Dr. At the moment, uh, the discussions are underway about what strains should be in the new vaccines, and that is an important step toward predicting the timing of the manufacturing. Is that guesswork or is that scientific? It is based on what strains are emerging at the end of this season here, as well as what strains are in the southern hemisphere as we speak. So the first step is the experts meet in Geneva at WHO to look at the, all the data, and then they meet with FDA here, I think in uh, about two weeks, that to uh, put their heads together and pick uh, the, the combination of the three strains that would go into the vaccine. Now, and I can have just add one very sure. quick thing, and that is that Secretary Levitt has just been on the job for a few days as Secretary of HHS, and already I have had two opportunities to brief him about avian flu and, and influenza preparedness with my colleagues. So I, I can tell you that this is a very high priority for the Department, and we are all focused on it. Well, thank you for all your good work. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Norton. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's, it's clear from both of your testimony that you, that you're doing the things that one would expect one to do to try to make up for uh, problems beyond your control, um, things that can be planned for, and I appreciate that you're doing that. Um, I'm interested far more in the meaning of this crisis for future. Um, for the future of the, of the flu vaccine and for other similar crises that could come up. Dr. Gerbling, I remember that uh, when this crisis arose, CDC did not even have access to the purchaser list. Uh, this, even though the purchaser list of the company that had produced vaccine um, and thus Initially, uh, CDC was unable to account for who had vaccine and who did not have vaccine in the first place. Um, apparently, after some time, uh, Venice did share its list with you. Is um, a Venice and other companies, are a Venice and other such companies required? to give you their list now as a matter of course. Uh, I would ask Dr. Uh, Goodman to answer that from the FDA perspective since they regulate that. Um, but we are hoping that um, even if the law does not mandate it, that we would be able to engage their cooperation in the future. We had a very successful cooperation. They provided us with very important market information of a highly competitive nature. We kept it confidential, utilized it for public health purposes, and I think established some real trust uh, between the public health system and the manufacturer. I will let Dr. Goodman talk about the regulatory perspectives. Yeah, we, you know, we don't actually, uh, you know, control who they distribute or to whom. And as Dr. Gerberding said, you know, that is an important part of their marketing strategy and, you know, is protected information. So I think you identify uh, an issue that, you know, in a public health crisis such that occurs can be a challenge. You know, I will say, uh, you know, and, and, and Dr. Gerberding could comment more because, you know, she was involved in then those distri difficult distribution issues. But when faced with this problem, um, my impression is that they have been forthcoming and shared information. Uh, one, uh, you know, but I think this is an issue, which is you have a system where the private distribution system is efficient under normal circumstances, and then when it's stressed by extraordinary circumstances, uh, it's a challenge to figure out how you deal with that. 
And I would add that um, there are, I can imagine in our scenario planning situations where we would very much like to have additional proprietary information about other products. So it is a gap in our capability of managing a public health emergency. Uh, even through your regulatory authority, even saying in the event of a, a uh, finding yeah. by the FDA or the uh, CDC or whoever is the appropriate authority, the list had to be turned over. And then surrounding those lists with the appropriate protections uh, in advance seems to me would be helpful. Again, my concern is with worst case uh, scenarios. And the fact is that Adventist did not immediately say, plop, here's my list. They did eventually give it. Uh, but the fact is that that should have been forthcoming instantly. And you were left there, Dr. Gerbling, without uh, any basis to, to proceed because you didn't even know where the vaccine was. This vaccine is going to continue to be in the private sector. This is the United States of America. And it's the kind of gap I would have expected by now uh, would have, uh, you, you would have begun to, to, to move on. I would like to ask you, uh, since I think that one is, is obvious, uh, what exercises have you gone through in the nature of worst case scenarios? Uh, I have read the, both of your testimony. Uh, they do indicate that you're doing the proper planning. My concern is with unanticipated health emergencies and with restoring the confidence of this committee and of the public that given anthrax, now given flu, if there is an unanticipated emergency, these are the kinds of things we do. I hate to use this analogy, but that's how the military, for example, prepares for the unforeseen. That's how the God help them, the, social, the uh, uh, Secret Service. Uh, prepares uh, and the security officials prepare for the unforeseen. Well, some of us regard health emergencies as more likely and at least as important. So I'd like to know if you have a regimen. Uh, well, let me let what me to do. let me uh, just say, Miss Norton, uh, we've got a vote. So make, make this answer very, very short if you can, please. Uh, the answer is we are constantly exercising scenarios. Just this week we had an anthrax scenario. This is a part of our preparedness planning for terrorism as well as for avian influenza and other health events. So on an ongoing basis at, around the tabletop and around the country, we are engaged in scenario-based exercises. That's one of the backbones of preparedness. Let me, I'd like to ask just a couple of quick questions. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, the U.S. has a much higher vaccination rate than most other countries, and particularly the countries in Southeast Asia. And I'm wondering how that, what that comparison is, if you know. And secondly, uh, how much higher is the rate of uh, flu in some of those countries where they have almost no or a very low vaccination rate? We have two things. Actually, we have three things. We have the best ability to measure vaccination, we have the most vaccine, and we have the highest vaccination rates. Uh, totally in the world, we produce each year about 300 million doses of vaccine. And we had 61 million of those doses in the U.S. this year. So you can see we uh, really uh, do have very um, high rates compared right. to the developing world. Is the rate of flu influenza m much, much higher in those countries where it's they It's difficult to say because the surveillance systems aren't there with the kind of high-tech capabilities we have here. But flu is a ubiquitous problem in all societies, and it as certainly is a problem in Asia. As far as we know, the flu shots that people have gotten this year, are they, are they for the strains of flu that are out there? It's a good so match this year. It's a good the match. Fujian strain has been the dominant strain, and that's the, the, the strain that the, uh, the vaccine is targeted to. And, and you said earlier you'll, you'll put three strains in the flu vaccine for next year. But I remember from another hearing there, how many strains are there? There's, There's an infinite number. number of flu strains. It's constantly evolving. But each year we pick uh, two A influenza strains and a B strain based on our scientific evidence that suggests what the most likely circulating strains will be. All right. We're going to, going to have to be in a very brief uh, recess. And uh, uh, Chairman Davis will be back in just a very few minutes. We'll be in recess.
to move to our second panel now. Um, and I want to thank these witnesses for appearing. Uh, we've invited uh, our second panel. We've got uh, Dr. Faye Bozeman. He's the director of Arkansas. Well, we'll have we'll bring him up here, and we also have Dr. Robert Struby, the Virginia State Health Commissioner. He's going to discuss Virginia's response uh, to the uh, shortage uh, turned surplus over the past few months. And Dr. Uh, Walter Orenstein, Associate Director of the Emory Vaccine Center, who will discuss recommendations. And last but not least, Dr. Alan Wasserman, Chairman of the Department of Medicine at George Washington Medical Center, George Washington University Medical Center here, is here to provide an academic perspective into issues surrounding the annual influenza vaccine. He will also share with us his experience last month when GW sponsored a free flu clinic at the Foggy Bottom Metro Station and they couldn't give away all their shots. Uh, before we swear in, uh, Mr. Bozeman, would you like to make an introduction? You can represent Thank you, Mr. the gentleman Chairman. from Arkansas, our colleague from the 3rd District. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is with pleasure uh, to have my brother here with us, uh, Dr. Faye Bozeman. Obviously, your younger brother, right? Uh, obviously. Uh, and a former state senator? I, I, I thought that you'd say, isn't this your dad? <laughs> but he. Uh, my brother and I, I'm an optometrist, my brother's an ophthalmologist, <laughs> and we practiced uh, together for many, many years. We were in an area that's one of the fastest growing areas in the country, so uh, whatever you did, you were successful at, and we were blessed in that way. But uh, his background is such, he was a pediatrician before he became an ophthalmologist. Uh, after, after practicing for many, many years, uh, got interested in public service and uh, became uh, the health department director for the state of Arkansas for Governor Huckabee. And uh, in true to form, uh, he went back and got his master's in public health uh, from Tulane. And I guess is probably one of the longest serving continuous uh, public health directors in the country right now. The, evidently, they don't last very long. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, it really is a pleasure to have him here, uh, really talking about both panels about such an important topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's the best you can do for your brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're happy to have all of you here. And uh, uh, Dr. Struby survived a long time in Virginia, and before that in Fairfax County, my home county, uh, where he uh, grew up and uh, headed our public health. So we're happy to have all of you here. Uh, uh, Dr. Wasserman, thank you for being here with GW, and I want to thank the medical faculty associates for being able to uh, offer uh, the flu shots th this afternoon. I hope we can give them away here. Uh, and Dr. Orenstein, thank you. It's the policy of this committee we swear everyone in, uh, so if you just rise with me and raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Bozeman, I'll, I'll start with you and we'll work our way down. We have. Um, Lights there with orange light means four minutes are up, red light means five. Your entire uh, written statements in the record and questions will be based on that. Uh, were you in the House or the Senate in Arkansas? Senate. So you know how to talk. Uh, if we can keep it to five minutes here, we usually have a tough time with you. But do, do your best. Uh, yes, say what you need to say, and then we'll get on to questions. But thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for being here today. Your brother's doing a good job, by the thank way. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and distinguished members of the House Government Reform Committee. I'm Faye Bozeman, Director of the Arkansas Department of Health, and I am honored to be testifying before you today on behalf of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. I want to thank the Chair and the members for convening this hearing on this very important public health topic. Let me begin by noting that from the start, this has been, there's been tremendous cooperation among federal, state, and local public health agencies. The experience this year is a classic example of how our nation's governmental public health system can and should work. In October of 2004, Arkansas and every other state and territory faced an unanticipated public health challenge when we learned that we would receive only half of our flu vaccine orders. Over the next few days, we worked with our partners to formulate a plan to deal with the shortage. We used the Health Alert Network to contact health providers throughout the states, telling them about the situation, asking them to provide us with information about how much vaccine they had ordered, 
uh, how much they had on hand and how much they needed for their high-risk patients. The Arkansas Department of Health typically purchases about 40 percent of flu vaccine supply in Arkansas, which meant that from the start we controlled a substantial portion of the vaccine that had been delivered to the state. I need to point out that in many cases most flu vaccine is purchased by the private sector. So some of my colleagues initially had much less control over the vaccine supply in their states and the distribution of that than I did. In Arkansas, we decided to exercise our mass vaccination plan, which we developed with the CDC Bioterrorism Preparedness Funds uh, to, de uh, uh, to distribute our supply of vaccine. Uh, November the 3rd was the day that we chose to do that. We enlisted the help of media outlets and healthcare professionals to get the word out. Thousands of people called our uh, newly created 1-800 hotline or logged onto our website to get information about where to go for the shots. Thankfully, the plan worked. And on November the 3rd, in a matter of hours, uh, we administered over 53,000 doses of vaccine uh, to high-risk individuals in 83 clinics. Despite everyone's best efforts, we may experience future vaccine shortages. A national plan should be developed that would provide guidelines for federal, state, and local health departments to follow when federal government determines that a shortage exists. For example, when Health and Human Services determines that a shortage exists, it should immediately create a secure data system that provides each state department with reliable and up-to-date information about vaccine orders and supplies in the states. The sooner public health officials have that information, the sooner they can work with their local health departments and health care providers to get information uh, out uh, to combat uh, the public panic. ASTRA agrees that we should provide incentives to manufacturers to stay in or enter the U.S. market. Under a Vaccine for Adult program, similar to the Vaccines for Children program now in place, the federal government would purchase flu vaccine and supply it to states for use by uninsured high-risk adults for whom flu vaccine is recommended. That would help needy Americans get vaccine while creating a market entry incentive by growing and stabilizing the flu vaccine market. Last but not least, uh, we need to increase the CDC's 317 National Immunization Program funding so that state and local departments can build adult immunization infrastructure as recommended by the Institute of Medicine in its Calling the Shots report. CDC immunization funding should be sufficient to allow states and local health departments to purchase flu and other recommended vaccines for all underinsured children, adolescents, and adults. I wish to thank this committee for its continuing interest in this important issue. The public health community is committed to ensuring that all individuals in need of vaccine receive it. We look forward to working with you to ensure that we have the resources and tools to do our job of protecting the public's health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you very much. Dr. Struby, thank you for being back with us. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, distinguished members of the committee, my name is Dr. Robert Struby. I'm the State Health Commissioner for Virginia. I'm honored to be testifying before you today. I'd like to thank the Chair and the subcommittee members for convening this hearing and for the amount of time you have devoted to this critical issue. Since news broke that British regulators suspended the license of flu vaccine manufacturer Chiron last October, state and local public health officials have been working to ensure the best use of available vaccine. Initially, that meant prioritizing vaccine availability to individuals at greatest risk for developing serious complications from the flu. More recently, it's included responsible relaxation of vaccine recommendations to include individuals outside the original high-risk groups to ensure the use of the remaining doses. VDH had ordered 90 percent of its total flu vaccine from Chiron, approximately 110,000 doses. However, the Health Department provides a very small proportion of the flu vaccine that is typically provided to the public. During our typical year, we provide about 70,000 doses of vaccine. Most of the vaccine is, is through the private sector. In response to the vaccine shortage, we immediately implemented the ACIP's recommendations re regarding the prioritization of flu vaccine. In addition, every effort was made to educate the medical community about the recommendations and urge compliance. 
A message was sent out to healthcare providers through our health alert network. We issued press releases, including information about the vaccine shortage and encouraged prioritization of available flu vaccine. State and local health departments received hundreds of phone calls from concerned citizens and numerous media interviews were conducted. We diligently worked to provide the best information available. From the beginning of the flu vaccine, CDC has worked, flu vaccine shortage, CDC has worked closely with Aventus to allocate and distribute all the remaining doses of vaccine. In the weeks and months following, VDH received four shipments of redistributed vaccine, with each targeting a high-risk population. In November, we received 80,000 doses of flu vaccine. The decision was then made to distribute the vaccine to each health district based on its population. Local health districts in Virginia were developed flu vaccine distribution plans tailored to meet the needs of their high-risk populations in their area. As the first doses of flu vaccine uh, from the CDC allocations began to arrive in late October and early November, the health districts began to implement their plans. Individuals not including the priority groups were asked to defer vaccine, vaccination in order to preserve the limited amount of vaccine. We received an, approximately 77,000 doses in mid-November, and this was primarily given to long-term care facilities across the state. This enabled nursing homes and assisted living facilities to vaccinate their vulnerable residents. In mid-November, we began to request vaccine through the CDC's web-based secure data network. This network allowed state public health officials the ability to order flu vaccine on behalf of private health care providers directly from CDC. As a result, we were able to distribute approximately 98,000 doses to, to Virginia's doctors and pharmacists. By the end of November, CDC and Aventus had distributed about 255,000 doses in Virginia. We sought to reach as many high-risk populations as possible, providing flu vaccine to health departments, long-term care facilities, and private docs. By late December, it appeared that the majority of high-risk persons in most parts of Virginia who wished to be vaccinated had obtained vaccine. A late December inventory revealed an ample supply of flu vaccine in many parts of the state. To help ensure that available flu vaccine did not go to waste, I authorized the expansion of vaccine recommendations to include individuals aged 50 to 64 and household contacts of those in high-risk categories. This took effect on January 10th. The expansion was in agreement with the revised ACFB recommendations. Even with the, rec with the expansion, there was little interest by private providers in placing an order for Virginia's fourth allocation of vaccine of approximately 55,000 doses. By the time the CDC orders were due to CDC on January 13th, only 30,000 doses had been requested. In late January, CDC began to support the expansion of vaccine eligibility for states and localities with ample supplies. On January 26, I authorized district health directors to, list, to lift their flu restrictions in the localities if they thought the demand for vaccine within priority groups had been met. On January 27th, CDC made VFC vaccine available to health departments for non-VFC children and adults in localities where the demand for flu vaccine among eligible children had been met. Local health departments have been authorized to redistribute this vaccine to other, facility, other public facilities, free clinics, community health centers, and private nonprofit facilities. Despite, despite VDH's effective response to unexpected shortage of flu vaccine, the continuing problems with flu vaccine availability pose great difficulties for our state in planning for next flu season. We do not know what the availability of flu vaccine will be next year. Will there be enough for everyone or high-risk groups only? If there is a continuing shortage, what will be the role of state and local health departments in vaccine distribution? Will things be done as in previous years with the private sector handling most of the distribution, or do we need to build on this year's ad hoc system using state and local health departments to coordinate distribution? Historically in Virginia, the private sector has administered the great majority of flu vaccine. This crisis led to much government intervention in the distribution and administration of vaccine. We wonder, will the private sector return to its former level of involvement? In Virginia, the trend has been for large businesses such as Walmart, drug chains, grocery store chains to provide much of the vaccine. Long lines, traffic congestion, unfavorable publicity this season may make them wary of continued participation. Private health care providers have been less active in flu administration over the last few years, and shortage may make them even less willing to deliver vaccine through their practices. The public has received many mixed messages about flu vaccine as the crisis developed. There were public campaigns that urged widespread immunization, then campaigns asked people not at high risk to defer a vaccine. There was a severe shortage of vaccine, then a surplus of vaccine with changing recommendations. Fortunately, to date, we had had a light flu season. However, this confusion has led to belief in some of the public that there was less vaccine, but we have less flu, maybe we really didn't need vaccine in the first place. How willing are they going to be to take flu, in the flu vaccine in future years? Throughout the crisis, our state and local health departments have devoted incredible amounts of our time to get to our most vulnerable citizens the vaccine they need. CDC has provided national leadership in a difficult and changing environment and worked very closely with us to meet the needs of our citizens, and we are appreciative of their efforts. 
The ultimate solution is development of adequate, secure, and stable supply of vaccine, as we have stated in previous testimony. We appreciate the amount of time and effort your committee has devoted to these issues, and we thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Dr. Orenstein, thank you for being with us. I am Walt Orenstein, Associate Director of the Vaccine Center at Emory University. Prior to joining Emory in March of 2004, I was the Director of the National Immunization Program at the CDC. I want to thank the Committee on Government Reform for the opportunity to address public health implications of the recent influenza vaccine shortages, assess, assess strategies used to minimize their impact, and recommend potential steps that may be taken to avert future shortages. Averting future shortages includes providing incentives, one, to manufacturers to enter or stay in the U.S. market, to providers to order and administer influenza vaccine, and to people for whom influenza vaccine is recommended to seek and accept vaccination. A critical incentive for manufacturers is to decrease financial risk for vaccine that is produced but must be discarded each year since last year's influenza vaccine cannot be used for the following season. One way to accomplish this is through a back-end guarantee program in which the federal government asks manufacturers to produce more doses than they usually would and pays the manufacturer at the end of the season for those extra doses that go unsold on the private market. For example, if the usual production is 80 million doses and the federal government wants 90 million doses produced to cover more of the 188 million persons for whom influenza vaccine is already recommended, then the government can guarantee the companies that they will pay some discounted price for each of the 10 million doses that may go unsold. As a further incentive to the companies, an effort should be undertaken to increase demand for influenza vaccine and thereby increase the size of the market. This should include at least three components. First, a national, state, and local educational effort directed at both the medical community and the public to promote use of vaccine. Second, an adult immunization grant program modeled after the successful childhood immunization program should be undertaken, which provides grants to states and localities to build immunization infrastructure for immunization of adults. This would include components such as outreach workers who can perform educational efforts staff who can provide technical assistance to health care providers to improve their performance, development of data systems to track and monitor vaccine supply and use and measure immunization coverage, and personnel who can assist nursing homes in conducting immunization programs. Third, influenza vaccine should be purchased by the federal government and supplied to states for uninsured high-risk adults for whom influenza vaccine is already recommended to minimize financial barriers to access and increase vaccine use. Incentives for providers include provision of free vaccine for their uninsured patients, decreasing their financial risk of potentially ordering vaccine that goes unused, access to technical assistance from state and local health departments, and provision of educational materials for their patients from those health departments. The major concern about the present problem is the potential for backsliding in our efforts to prevent the significant burden of influenza. While it is too early to tell if this season will be mild, if it turns out to be, many of the people who might have received the vaccine in the past but were unable to receive it this year may have a false sense of security that they do not need vaccine. Unfortunately, influenza is difficult to predict, and if a mild season were to occur this year, it does not mean next year will be mild. If it turns out the season is moderate to severe, unfortunately, many people who might have gained benefits from vaccination may suffer, either because they did not seek it or because they were unable to obtain vaccine. One of the more effective strategies in reducing influenza is to reduce exposure of high-risk persons to influenza by vaccinating their close contacts. Many more high-risk persons may be exposed because their contacts were not vaccinated due to supply problems. Given the shortage, could anything have been done differently to minimize its burden? 
I think CDC did the best it could under the circumstances. There was a need to prioritize vaccine, and the priorities chosen by the experts on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices were reasonable. This meant delivering messages to others to forego vaccination. In conclusion, the influenza virus can cause a substantial health burden. Influenza vaccination is the best way to prevent this burden. The shortages are a result of a lack of manufacturer incentives to enter and stay in the U.S. market. Averting future shortages and averting the influenza burden, burden involves providing incentives to manufacturers to produce vaccine, providers to order and administer it, and the general public to seek and accept vaccine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Wasserman. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Members of the committee, at the height of influenza season last year, more than 10 percent of all deaths were related to pneumonia and influenza. In 12 of the past 21 years, the peak month for flu activity in the United States has been in February or March. Now, we may get lucky this year and see fewer cases, but the chances are that the greatest f threat from influenza is still before us, and yet we cannot give away flu vaccine. We are only now seeing our offices filled with patients with flu-like symptoms, and our hospitals had to close on multiple occasions in the past week because beds are filled to capacity with patients with flu and complications from flu. It is not just the Pope who has been hospitalized with influenza-induced pneumonia. And yet, we cannot give away free flu vaccine. After treating our high-risk patients, we have been left with approximately 3,600 doses of vaccine. And when the city relaxed restrictions, we hastily convened an all-day flu vaccine fair at the Foggy Bottom Metro Station on January 13th. Thanks to the local media, we were able to publicize this event widely with constant radio reminders that included a live telecast on site throughout the day. Our doctors, nurses, interns, and residents spent the day administering free flu shots, but in the end, we were left with over half our remaining supply. The headline in the Washington Post had it correct. GW stuck it to 1,889 people, but where were the others? Where was the passion, the anxiety, the response that we saw in November and December to those free sessions that were offered before restrictions were put into place? We stood outside for over eight hours, and yet we couldn't give away all our free flu vaccine. We will probably end up the year with over 1,500 doses going unused. Therefore, we and many health care organizations like us will be left with incurring the cost of unused vaccines, but more importantly, thousands of Americans will get sick needlessly. Now, this has been a very unusual year, and this is a complicated issue involving the health of our community and our country. But I would hope that this committee could address some important questions that have health care workers and probably the public perplexed. If vaccinating our population for influenza is such a priority, why is there no safeguard in producing vaccine? Which would cost more, redundancy in vaccine production with risk of oversupply or the significant added cost to the government in Medicare and Medicaid payments for flu-related illnesses and hospitalizations? Why do, does our country's grocery stores receive their vaccine shipment well before most health care providers? Is that the way we'll ensure that high-risk patients will be vaccinated? Debilitated patients, those on oxygen and others, usually do not have the stamina to fight their way in line and stand for hours. Is this really a public service or a setup for public panic? Can we continue giving mixed messages to the public? One year it is get your vaccine in October and November, and the next year the public is told it's still okay to get a shot in January or February. Skepticism is, skepticism is very high among the public now that we're pushing vaccine at this very late date. Some may think that we're only doing so not to look foolish, ending the season with a surplus, while others certainly may think that it's just the greedy physician out to make the extra dollar. To add to confusion, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Virginia each had different regulations some with monetary penalties for flu vaccine distribution. In such, in such interrelated areas where patients from one jurisdiction often see physicians in another, shouldn't uniform policies be considered? There's much to be learned from what happened this year, but this year is not over. People remain at risk for what could be a virulent next two months. Earlier this year, members of Congress and their staff set the example by not being inoculated thereby encouraging the public to refrain from getting flu shots so there will be enough for the high-risk group. Well, I believe now the time has come for Congress to once again lead the way in getting inoculated now to encourage others to come forward while there is still time. 
Throwing away vaccine and filling our hospital beds would be a sad ending to a very difficult season. And on that note, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned, we will be administering free flu vaccine starting today at 1 o'clock upstairs in room 2247. We will be here until we run out of vaccine. I hope that's not too long. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, uh, I want to thank the generosity of uh, George Washington University Medical Faculty Associates for making this uh, available. We're going to get the word out uh, here. Um, I'll start questioning Mr. Dent. Mr. Dent, do you, are you, are you ready? Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ornstein, uh, I represent uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, just south of the Aventus Pasteur plant in uh, Swiftwater, Pennsylvania. And I know you've talked a lot about incentives. Uh, are you satisfied what's been, with, the, with what's been done to date uh, to make sure that the Aventus and perhaps any other pharmaceutical manufacturers are going to be uh, ready uh, to deal with this situation next season? I think there have been some major progress uh, that has been done. I think very good collaborative relationships have been developed. I think potentially more can be done. I know we're focused very much on high-risk individuals, but if you look at for whom flu vaccine is recommended, it's recommended for contacts of those people. There is substantially more people who need to get vaccinated. And it's not clear to me that we have enough incentives right now in order to really boost production. I think, in essence, we ought to be considering perhaps a five-year plan to get to close to the 188 million Americans for whom we already recommend vaccine. And I think, to me, the people who can actually answer that question best are the manufacturers themselves. But I am concerned that we perhaps have some, but not all the incentives we need. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm somewhat concerned, too, in that the beyond Aventus, uh, it doesn't seem that there are too many domestic uh, manufacturers of this particular product. And uh, well, selfishly, I certainly like to see Aventus get the business because my constituents work in that plant where they manufacture. Uh, it would probably be in the public's interest and in this, this country's interest to uh, uh, diversify the base. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wangsman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Bozeman, your brother and the chairman had very nice things to say about you, and I'm pleased that you're here. I just want to say something nice about your brother, because he and I have been working together on legislation to protect uh, children from harm from contact lenses that, are, that, that have not been prescribed and not appropriately uh, placed in their eyes. And he's been a great legislative ally. Uh, as, the, as the person in charge of the uh, uh, state and territorial health officials, uh, could you t uh, tell us about the financial difficulties states have, have in providing all routinely recommended vaccines to children? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and let me follow that up with another question uh, at the same time. Does the President's budget fully address the problems that you do have at the state level? The problems that we're having and have had, and we've all tried to solve them in different ways, uh, is that we're getting more and more uh, vaccinations, uh, um, most recently Prevnar, and the cost per child keeps going up. Now, we have the Vaccine for Children's program, which enables us to give that eligible child a full complement of vaccination. Uh, but uh, many children fall through that crack, and so then we're left with uh, the 317 side of the system uh, or, to try and uh, uh, serve children. Uh, for a year in Arkansas, we had a two-tiered system where we simply couldn't fill that gap. Uh, now, we, uh, the way we uh, solved that was through the uh, federally qualified uh, community health centers. They deputized our clinics, the health department's clinics, and that enabled us then, uh, that made children coming into us eligible uh, on the uh, vaccine for children's side. <laughs> We've got new vaccines coming, um, e even more. and so. I think this problem is going to get bigger. So the answer to your question is, no, we don't have enough funding right now uh, to be able to uh, vaccinate everybody the way we ought to. And, and I, I, you know, as somebody that comes from a pretty conservative perspective, 
there's not many things that uh, Congress can spend money on that they get a better return on. Yes, uh, absolutely. Every dollar that you spend, uh, I think I saw a figure this morning of maybe $27 in reduced you know, medical costs, and it was mentioned about uh, what it's costing for people to be in the hospital with it's pneumonia and things like that. It's certainly less expensive to prevent yeah. the disease than to have to pay to treat a disease that could have been prevented. That's exactly right. You uh, testified that you would support a Vaccines for Adults program modeled on the very successful Vaccines for Children program. And that certainly seems like a sensible idea to me. If the federal government could expand and guarantee a vaccine market like it does with pediatric vaccines, this could be, a, I think, a powerful incentive for the manufacturers, the companies, to get into the business and stay in the business. Because we do have this question of, of what business decision they'll make if they have this uncertain market. Do you think that this would shore up that our fragile vaccine supply? Well, I think it certainly would be a great step in the right direction because, as you have said, uh, it, it creates the market. And, and, you know, our country has a history of where there's a market uh, people fill in, just as Representative Dent just mentioned. I think there will be other uh, people that see that potential, and, and I, I think other manufacturers would enter in. I think it's certainly a first step and see what happens. Uh, other things may be necessary, but that certainly to me is, is a very uh, important first step. Uh, we've heard from local health officials that they can't provide important vaccines uh, such as the hepatitis B vaccine, even to high-risk people, such as people who come to uh, sexually transmitted disease clinics, uh, they can't provide it because the cost is so high. Do you think that a Vaccines for Adults program should be broad enough to include all routinely recommended vaccines for adults, including the hepatitis B vaccine? Yes, sir, I do. Dr. Uh, Ornstein, uh, you... Um, used to direct the National Immunization Program at CDC. You're an expert on the Vaccines for Children program. Uh, do you, you, in your testimony, said you would also like a Vaccines for Adult uh, program. H how do you think they would differ? And do you think this would uh, help us uh, set up a reliable distribution system and uh, expand the number of adults that would be vaccinated? When I was proposing in my testimony, testimonies of beginning vaccines for adult program that could be expanded to cover every groups, the big group that I've been concerned about, just like the vaccines for children program was concerned about, is uninsured adults. And the Institute of Medicine has estimated that somewhere around 8 million high-risk uninsured adults are in need of influenza vaccination. I think having a vaccines for adults program that would provide vaccine in doctor's offices, potentially other sites that are more convenient, such as grocery stores, goes a long way to reducing the financial challenges. We made a statement when we covered influenza vaccine by Medicare that reducing the financial barriers to access was really critical. For the uninsured who may very well be uh, in some of these high-risk groups or contacts of high-risk groups, I think we also need to reduce that problem. The other advantage that is, takes place with the Vaccines for Children program and my hope with the Vaccines for Adults program, it establishes a public-private partnership. If you bring vaccine to the table and you give it to a physician, it allows you to work more, more effectively with that physician at trying to work on their immunization performance. And that's been a big boon, I think, in terms of the Vaccines for Children program in helping to cement that kind of relationship. What, what vaccines should be included? Well, I think the initial one I've focused on is influenza. I think certainly as you've, uh, and I think that others could be added over time. I think the one you raise is a very important one. Hepatitis B now is primarily a problem among high-risk adults, many of whom we access in STD clinics, in HIV clinics, in a variety of other places, but we don't have the vaccine to provide it, and that might be one other group to consider. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. you. Dr. Bozeman, millions of doses of flu vaccine are thrown away every year at the end of the season. Um, have states ever considered extending the annual shot campaign, uh, which usually takes place in the fall through January or February to maximize the amount of Americans vaccinated? Yes, sir, we have. The problem is, and Dr. Gerberdine alluded to this, is that the demand just falls off. 
Uh, it, it, no, no matter, it seems like what we do, there, there, we, are, we are conditioned almost that um, in October, November, you get your flu shot, and after that, uh, you don't, uh, again, no matter what we say, uh, and we've tried uh, many different... They get this time of year, they think they've made it through. They think they've made it. Okay. That's it. And, and, and again, testimony that you just heard, this is the time we're the most worried about, is right okay. now. Okay. Uh, but but, but in, in the past, we've, we've hoped that we could get people covered, uh, you know, so that they can go into this time of the year uh, without. The, 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 the rock and the hard place this year was we didn't have vaccine, uh, and so we, uh, we, we, you know, we, we pushed and, and, and got the high risk. I, I think we have a better coverage of high risk, in Arkansas anyway, we have better coverage of high risk people than we've ever had. But then you, you, you have a little vaccine left over and you, you're afraid to open it up too much because you, you know you're, you're, you, you get a run and, and uh, I guess Dr. Strube, we've got the same problem in Virginia that uh, there's just little interest by private providers in placing an order uh, after our fourth allocation. Yeah, and they're scared that they're, they're going to get stuck with the vaccine and people aren't wanting it anymore. I know my wife hasn't even gotten vaccinated. I haven't been able to talk her into it and she's at high risk and she deferred even though she should have, but she said, you know, and, and I'm going to have to take a dose home and shoot her myself. <laughs> well, I'm not going to touch that one, but that's <laughs> good luck. You need a place to stay, you know She's from Fairfax County, too, yeah. Okay, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you also, Dr. Struby, that we've had problems with the, uh, and also uh, Dr. Wasserman, uh, Dr. Wasserman talked about confusion of patients living in the different regions that we really weren't very regionally coordinated uh, at this point. Is there anything we can do to try to get better regionally coordinated, particularly for the, because uh, a lot of pa Virginia patients go to have doctors in Maryland and vice versa. Anything well, we can do on a regional basis, I asked Dr. Wasserman the same thing. What we tried to do was go by what the ACIP and CDC were saying so it would be a uniform message that we would match up with the country. Right. I was under pressure from different areas, had different situations, do different things, right. and I resisted that. So I think the more we follow, all the states follow kind of the, um, the national guidelines, the better off you are. Now, some of the issues had to do with the regulatory part. Uh, in Virginia, we didn't have uh, a regulation that said if you had to give it only to the high risk, we did it only by um, public information and getting information out to the doctors and other places went ahead and made it actually um, a violation of the rules and regs if you get it out, gave it to people outside. And so there's probably some need there for uniformity. Okay. Dr. Rossman, you got any thoughts on that? Well, there has to be some standardized policy. Uh, we had some jurisdictions that were assigning monetary penalties to physicians if they gave it to the wrong patients, and yet they had surplus of vaccine, and therefore they couldn't use it for fear of being yeah. fined or uh, That's uh, what happens when the government gets involved. Uh, well. You know, it, legislatively, you lose your flexibility, and I think you get the law of unintended consequences. So, no, but you have a lot of Virginia patients at MFA, a lot of Maryland patients that come down. That's to correct. Right. So, is it fair for only the Virginia patients that, you know, or you know, that come to us to be able to get it, not the Virginia patients that stay in Virginia? It just yeah. seems to me that we're so, we're so closely knit here that there has to be some way to coordinate. Is there a consensus this has been a fairly mild year uh, by for, by flu standards across the country? Up to now, but if you look at the uh, recent papers, if you look at the recent reports, uh, CNN just reported yesterday, uh, the governor of uh, Maryland has asked the public to stop calling 911 because of the overwhelming calls for because of flu. I mean, we're just starting to see a greater peak now than we've ever seen. So this may turn out to be mild, and it may not. We, I think the next couple of weeks will tell. It's somewhere in Virginia. We're beginning this week. Uh, we went to um, widespread flu for the first time this year. So this is a good time to get your shot, actually, sure. to put, because it may, may start to hint. Um, Dr. Orenstein, you state in your written testimony that you believe CDC did its best under the circumstances uh, earlier this year, uh, but you still recommend establishing an educational effort at the national, the state, and the local levels. Um, how would the educational effort you envision add to the work of CDC to inform the public? I think what it would do is develop a cadre of people, a cadre of materials, and an ability on a year-round basis to continue to educate. One of the great hurdles is dealing with the medical care community. The coverage rates in the medical community have only been about 43 uh, percent, I think was the last 
data that I saw from CDC. Uh, a few years ago, it was only 38 percent. We have some real re-education to do, and that, I think, is where the grant program will be helpful, because these are the kinds of people who would go into hospitals and give grand rounds to work with Dr. Wasserman and others in terms of trying to champion it among the staff. One of the most effective interventions that has occurred was in Rochester a number of years ago, where staff from the health department went in, or went in and reviewed doctors' records and set up a target population for them to reach in vaccination. And that significantly improved their coverage. So the educational effort is not simply a media campaign, although that is probably an important part of it. It involves a whole series of kinds of education and education efforts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Watson. I'm sorry that I wasn't here for panel one, but with panel two, what are we doing to be able to plan for future uh, flu seasons? And are we doing enough here in our country to manufacture the flu vaccine so we don't have to depend on foreign suppliers? Anyone on the panel who feels they can tackle that? I, I, I can talk about the manufacturing issue and perhaps okay, well, one of the health officers exactly. will talk about the other. I think at the moment it's going to be very difficult to try and get a U.S. manufacturing base back. Explain. What we've had is we had in 2000, uh, we had four U.S. Uh, uh, three U.S. manufacturers and one foreign manufacturer. Two dropped out of the market. I think to try and bring the two that dropped out back might be very difficult at this point because you'd have to redo their plants, you'd have to give substantial investments. There is some hope with some foreign manufacturers coming into the U.S. market. Uh, GlaxoSmithKline has a plant in Germany and they've announced interest in coming into the U.S. market. ID Biomedical has a plant in Canada they're interested in coming in. I think if we provide incentives, there may be more manufacturers who come in, but we'd have to provide substantial incentives. I think the 188 million do, uh, person market, which is what potentially is there, if we could begin to move forward in that way, more companies would come in. And I think we're getting the interest from the two European manufacturers, well, the Canadian and the European manufacturer, purely because they see a much bigger market here. Um, anyone from CDC at the table? Well, maybe I can ask this of the chair. Why is it that we could not put in CDC's budget uh, a line that would start to promote the manufacturing here in this country? You said we had four or two have dropped out. And why couldn't we pump up uh, American manufacturers of the flu vaccine? you have any idea? Or well, I can just say, I mean, if, uh, on, the, on the CDC side, CDC's budget's gone up uh, from uh, 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 ninefold, I think, nine times since 2001. But it's really the FDA that would be responsible for that. And I think that as a result of this year, no one had uh, planned on the Chiron plant being closed down, which was Okay, supplied well, about 45 percent of what was going on, and now we're looking for other folks. But it's a risky business, as you know. You, you produce vaccines, and you may end up uh, producing stuff that can't be sold. It's not a high margin uh, uh, material. Once you produce it, you don't make a lot on each dose the way you do uh, with a prescription drug or something like that. Well, um, let me ask this. Can the vaccines that are in the surplus supply now be held over to another season. They, you can hold them over, but they won't be any good because you get a different s strand every year. I mean, that's the that's the difficulty with this. You well, last. it seems to me some of the big uh, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturers here in this country would uh, maybe take this on as one of their divisions. So, if it's a slow year, one year, and they lose money, it can be compensated for in another division. Uh, but I think we need to be able to monitor the development of the vaccine right here in this country because it was the supply that we were counting on, Chevron, that uh, had some problems. 
And I don't know how we anticipate this, but I think that if we had it, uh, if we had the supply, and I would say at least if it's not the majority supply, a supplemental supply uh, constantly being developed here by our manufacturers, we would be able to guard against the foreign manufacturers who run into problems in their research labs. And uh, this is something that I'm just throwing out. Right. FDA in their testimony earlier talked about how they're trying to get, uh, you, you, know, you know, find more product and make sure that we yes. get more product uh, coming in. Uh, a lot of these facilities are done overseas because it's frankly cheaper to produce them that work. Well, and why would you overpay for something if you can produce it and, and keep it as clean? And, and, and for the most part, uh, there's no evidence that uh, vaccines that are produced wholly or partly abroad uh, have any uh, uh, less power or potency. Um, uh, my concern in this particular era is always going on the cheap. And I have that concern in other products that are produced mm -hmm. abroad and we consume here in this country. We have very little control over the process of production. So I, I want to start the debate of not always looking for the cheapest way out. I think this flu vaccine uh, problem heightens our motivation to start looking at, is cheaper always better? Okay. And should we not invest in quality when it comes to a life-saving or a life-sustaining product like a flu mm -hmm. vaccine. So I just throw that out, Mr. Chair, as food for thought and as continuing debate. Yeah, well, nothing like a crisis to get everybody put their thinking caps on and yeah, see, uh, exactly. see, see what can happen on this. I think uh, you gentlemen have uh, worked under extraordinary circumstances. And you said, if anything, well, we've done a better job and we thought we found supply that we didn't think we'd find. Now we, the people that were demanding flu shots, we can't get people to take them. So, uh, there's still time, you're telling me. In a couple months, we could still hit the peak. Um, can you, let me just ask this question. Can you tell from what's happening in other parts of the world how virile the, and, 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 and tough the flu season could be by what's happening in other countries, or is it just so different when it comes up here, there's no way of telling? You know, you know what I'm saying? You, you, you no, I, I, I think very articulate, but. last year with the Fujian strain, we were hearing about outbreaks in other parts of the world that were moderate to severe. And so that gave us a picture that we were probably going to get a moderate to severe year in the U.S., which we wound up having. Uh, there is some potential that what goes on there will have a similar impact here, but it's still not 100 uh, percent predictability. And as Dr. Wasserman said, I think it's, this still could turn out to be a problematic year. We just don't know yet. It's still fairly early. Most flu seasons peak in February. And uh, in fact, we've had flu seasons peak in March, uh, April, and even May, so that there is a potential for it uh, to occur. But it's difficult to predict. What is really important in looking at what happens overseas is to look at which strains are emerging so that we can determine what ought to go in the vaccine. Uh, last year, we were behind on that, and so we had, a, although the vaccine was effective, we had a mismatch. Right. I guess, if anything, if I got any quarrel with today's testimony, it wasn't from this panel. The first panel where they had the states uh, that had the most uh, significant infestation of flu uh, were, were red states. I just, you know, but. Um, uh, you would like that, Mrs. Watson. But uh, I think everybody has closed ranks uh, pretty much. This has been a, a – hopefully it stays a mild year and this uh, – so that the damage won't be too great. We can use this as a learning experience and maybe avert something uh, worse uh, at a later time. Thank you all for being here. I think it's been very, very helpful to us. I want to – closing, I want to remind everyone of the free, free flu shot clinic today in the Rayburn Building at 2247. Uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., and it is open to the public. You don't have to be a Capitol Hill employee. You don't have to be a member of Congress. Uh, basically, the last time we ran f that um, uh, George Washington University Medical School was giving away flu shot, they couldn't give enough away at the subway station there. It's Foggy Bottom. So uh, this is open to the public today. 
and Rayburn 2247 from 1 to 3 uh, p.m. Thank you. And I, again, want to thank the witnesses for their testimony. I want to thank the committee staff that worked on this hearing, and I ask unanimous consent that the statement of Mark Malatek uh, of uh, Henry Schein, Inc. be included in the hearing record. And hearing no objection, it's so ordered. And so uh, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. You're looking at a live picture right now from the National Building Museum here in Washington, D.C., the site of many events throughout the year. Tonight, a live dinner uh, coverage for you.